you so much for finding time to talk to us. As I was uh, coming, um, I saw a, a long line of uh, Uzbek citizens waiting um, for their appointments and, you know, with excitement in their eyes, you know, <laughs> hoping to get um, U.S. visas. Are you back full scale? I mean, is this post-pandemic period now? Yes, we are absolutely, 100% certainly open. Uh, we provide uh, full range of consular services, and uh, that means we are open for most, uh, uh, most visa categories, immigrant uh, visas and non-immigrant visas, as well as American citizen services. We started uh, resuming and restarting our operations about in July and August of last year, and that followed about a 15-month period where we had either no or limited consular services due to the pandemic. Uh, because we had implemented a number of uh, COVID safety uh, restrictions. Many people thought that the consulate was completely closed during the pandemic, but you did operate, right? We operated, it, for a certain period of time, uh, we had some limited services, but there were periods where it was mostly closed. So uh, I would say that on, on average, we had very few services during that, that period, and, and which is, why right now there's a significant uh, backlog of services and a high demand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was going to ask about the backlog because almost on a daily basis we get a dozen of questions at least about what to do, how to approach the U.S. consulate here, and, and questions regarding visas, of course, DV lottery. I would <laughs> like to discuss all of, all of those issues with you today. Um, but the backlog, what kind of a number are we talking about here? Well, so the backlog uh, primarily was for immigrant visas, right? Because those are, those are- uh, For immigration. Visa, for immigration, mm -hmm. those are a category that people have submitted petitions for and that are scheduled to come to the, to the embassy uh, way in advance. And it was, it was very significant, uh, a high number, and worldwide, this is a, a worldwide problem, uh, thousands of, of visas are backlogged because new visas were being, new petitions were being approved and yet they weren't being processed. So this creates the backlog. So since uh, August, uh, we've cut that in more than half. Um, meanwhile, we've also been opening up all of our services too. So it's been a balance of uh, our time and resources to open up everything. But of course, when you're, when you're trying to reduce a backlog, you have to do more than you normally do uh, because new cases are continually coming in and we still have to tackle the cases that we already have. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it's, I think, our, our number one challenge, and, uh, and, but we've made you know, significant progress, and that's a credit really to the excellent concert team that we have. All right, so during the pandemic, when we talked to the State Department about, about the, the counselor services, the state of counselor mm -hmm. services around the world, they told us that they had decreased the number of uh, workers, basically, staff. How many people work at the consulate here? It's a, it's a, I would say it's a medium-sized mm -hmm. um, counselor section. Uh, there's certainly, you know, ones in, in bigger places like, you know, Mexico and, and, and China are, are, are very large. But uh, this is a, a pretty significantly sized uh, section because we perform all the services. Some, some consular sections only do non-immigrant visas or only immigrant visas. We do all the services. So it's a mixture of local staff, uh, local Uzbek. Uh, citizens and American staff. Yeah, considering the fact that there is just one council and you obviously have a lot of a lot of demand, mm -hmm. uh, does the level of demand change? Uh, I guess the way you offer services or the size of your service. Do you does that is that a factor? I'm sure that would be a factor. It's just it isn't a factor right now because the level <laughs> of demand is so high. So I haven't actually experienced that um, uh -huh, uh -huh. yet. Uh, right now, the demand for non immigrant visas, you know, the tourist, student, mm -hmm. uh, business visas are, are very high. Mm -hmm. And it's been difficult to get uh, an uh, online visa appointment. We, mm -hmm. we recognize that problem. We're, we're taking steps to, to, to work through that. Um, so the demand continues to be high. But in, in a normal operations, there would be periods where we're busier than others. Mm -hmm. I'm asking that question because, you know, when, when we hear from the people, they usually complain that it's just too long to wait. It's so hard to get an appointment. You know, I've spent hours and hours, weeks trying to get an appointment. Why don't they increase? You know, why don't they improve the service? They ask. Mm -hmm. I tell them usually that, well, you have to wait. It's just that's how the counselor services work around the world. And you just have to be patient. But people are always impatient. You deal with the highest level of impatience and the highest levels of eagerness and excitement. How do you um, 
strategize in general as a, as a counselor service. I, I agree. It's a valid concern for the people who have to wait. And we, you know, it's not ideal and it's, and it's something that I think that is unique for right now because there's just such big worldwide demand uh, as a result of the pandemic. So we are trying to tackle that in a number of ways. We do continue open new appointments every week. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, of course, will admit that those appointments get taken up pretty quickly. Uh, secondly, though, we do have an interview waiver program. So if someone is trying to renew their U.S. visa, if they're applying for uh, a visa of the same visa category, so say they had a tourist visa and now are looking to apply for another tourist visa, they can, um, they can apply for that renewal without an interview. So that is, that is one way we kind of take the pressure off our you know, resources for interviews. So that is an available service that we are providing every week. Um, thirdly, I would just say that uh, if someone does have urgent kind of emergency travel, uh, they can send us an email and we will certainly consider this request. So, for example, you know, urgency and emer emergencies differ from person to person. Like but for medical purposes, for example, exactly. or for study purposes. Exactly. So if there's a student that needs to get to the university, we will certainly expedite that. If there's uh, someone going for a medical treatment, you know, if someone has a plane ticket that they bought and just needs to you know, urgently visit New York, um, well, we get that, but it's not going to qualify for an expedited appointment. That person would still need to try to get an online appointment. And I would just, just, just say that as we work through the backlogs in some visa categories, we'll be able to devote more time and resources to non-immigrant visas. So we do see a period where we will be able to expand even further our, our non-immigrant visa services so there won't be such a long wait time. And so the situation, our operations will seem a little bit more normal. What kind of a timeline are we talking about in terms of tool, you know, in terms of overcoming the backlog? So I think we've made significant progress against our immigrant visa backlog. And I think sometime about the summer, we should be close to have eliminating it entirely. Back uh, to we, normalcy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's, it would be a great relief because, uh, like I said, that the, the consular team has been working very hard. It's, uh, it's very demanding. Uh, the immigrant visas are, are, are longer and more resource intensive than a, than a tourist visa. So we are looking at a timeline of sometime in the summer we have eliminated, we've already eliminated certain categories of visas where there were backlog, they're now zero. Um, and then once we're there, we're able to kind of shift more resources toward the non-immigrant visas. Uh, as you saw today with, with um, yeah. the line out there, those are all people coming for, for tourist uh, student yeah, exchange Yeah, yeah, G1 visitors. applications exactly. and others like for work and travel, for tourists. Mm -hmm. uh, I was actually surprised because I thought that you were um, issuing just a specific kind of visas nowadays, not necessarily for tourists, for business and mm -hmm. for study. I know some got student visas mm -hmm. even during the pandemic, I think, mm -hmm. but you, you, you had exceptions, right? You were not considering every application. That, that's correct. Correct. And I would say beginning September, we opened up our non visas to all categories. Uh. So we were a little, I think, probably a little ahead of the curve than most uh, embassies and consulates worldwide. By September, we were offering uh, tourist visas to the United mm -hmm. States. What are some of the uh, most like typical challenges for you to that you deal with on a day to day basis with Uzbek citizens? What are things that they should keep in mind as they come? to make, I guess, their lives easier <laughs> or cases easier? Well, there's the one thing on the appointments, and I think that's a valid concern that people have. So uh, that is something, you know, people need to obviously plan ahead, but right now it's difficult for people to do that when we have very limited, it's very difficult to get an appointment. Like, I think I completely get that, and that's something that we will fix. Um, but for the average, you know, visa applicant that comes to us, and it kind of depends on, on what visa category, if they're an immigrant or non-immigrant, but for most, a lot of non-immigrants are tourist business travelers. Um, I would say that, you know, as far as like tips for, for, the, for the interview, I would uh, encourage people to be, of course, first and foremost, be honest on your application and during the interview. Uh, if there are things that are not credible or things that are less than truthful, then it kind of undermines your application. So that's, you know, that's, don't, don't try to imagine what you think the consular officer wants to know. Um, but be honest and tell your story about why you want to go to the U.S. So I wouldn't hide things thinking, oh, well, if I say this, then I'll certainly get refused. Uh, you know, for example, say you're studying at a university, you've selected a university, and you've chosen, one of the reasons you've chosen that university is because you have family in the area. 
that makes sense to us that you would go don't somewhere. Don't lie about that. Don't lie about that. Exactly. There's hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of universities and colleges in the United States, and if one place that particularly appeals to you, one of the reasons is because you have an uncle or your brother is attending this university. That is a good reason. We we understand that. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't hide that because then that would probably undermine your application. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Um, there's many, many uh, other tips I, I, I can provide. Um, to be honest is definitely uh, the most important uh, requirement. And actually, that's what we usually encourage people to be when they ask us. Because, you know, being the voice of America, they think we know everything about what you do, but we don't. And of course, you know, we follow your work and we read everything diligently, whatever, uh, you know, is out there. When I was just sort of chatting with some of the people outside. Today, a young man came up and asked about work and travel, and mm -hmm. he's already been issued a visa. Um, so I think like March 17th, but he has a paper that says the program starts sometime in May. So his question was, and I think he's coming to, uh, to talk about that, he wants some explanation. So once you issue the visa, whatever the kind, mm -hmm. can they travel to the United States any time from that date, or are there exceptions or specific details that they need to pay attention? There's some exceptions per visa category. Uh, for tourist and business travelers, you if you get once you get the visa, you You're could good. be on the plane that that evening. Mm. Uh, for students, you need to show up. Uh, you can't show up more than 30 days before you travel. Mm. So there are some, some. And for work and travel. For someone work and travel, I think there are some uh, restrictions on when your program begins and then when you need to when you need to show mm -hmm, up. Mm -hmm. And we, we have a lot of this information on our website, and people, of course, can can write to us or check out the website. Yeah, yeah. My suggestion to this young man was read the paperwork. <laughs> That's usually <laughs> like, you know, a good suggestion. <laughs> read the paperwork. Pay attention to the to the mm -hmm. details, right? Yes, and we do have a lot of information on our website. It's in Uzbek, Russian, and English. Mm -hmm on the different visa categories. And we also have uh, you know, our public inboxes that people can reach out to on specific questions. They are pretty full, and it it's, might take us a couple of days to get, get an answer, but we do read them. One typical complaint that you hear from the Uzbek citizens is that I'm denied. I'm denied. They, uh, there are all kinds of research that people have done, um, believe it or not. I mean, this is all qualitative, mm -hmm. but the general belief is that most of the applicants get denied and they speculate why. Uh, what are some of the like, top reasons that people get denied? Yeah, so it of course depends on what visa category. For our immigrant visas, um, most of the cases are overwhelmingly issued. Because uh, those cases, uh, they're already prior approved in the United States through the US Citizenship and Immigration Service, and uh, they come through us. So by and large, those are, are generally uh, approved. Um, and then, of course, it kind of depends. We have you know, different outcomes on your visa category, uh, you know, whether it's a student or whether you're going for, you have a work visa. So those, there's uh, some differences there. Um, the common reason where, like, uh, a non-immigrant visa, like a tourist business traveler, gets refused is probably because they haven't demonstrated that they intend on um, returning to their home after a brief uh, travel to the United States. And that's that's per the regulations of that visa class that every visa applicant has to show that they, uh, that they are not an intending immigrant. Uh, and so they actually have to overcome a presumption that they are. So it's when they're at the interview, you have to convince the consular officer that your travel to the United States, whether it's for a business holiday, see family, is a temporary stay and that you have compelling reasons that would uh, make you come back. So. If an applicant hasn't really shown that, or it's not quite clear, uh, that is the most likely reason someone would be refused a visa. And it doesn't depend on his or her economic status or financial status, right? Because you know, believe it or not, I have talked to at least five Uzbek millionaires who were denied mm -hmm. okay. American visas, and they were, you know, they were some of them were shell shocked, saying that I've shown them all everything that they wanted. I've shown, I've, I've, I've provided them a financial guarantee that I was going to come back because I have this huge business in Uzbekistan, and yet they denied. So we look at every case individually, and we look at the totality of circumstances. I can't speak particularly no, yeah, about, yeah, no, no, about their case, but generally, I, I know that uh, affluent people have certainly uh, got <laughs> visas, but. You know, a whole range of persons uh, we see, which is the great thing about being in the, in the concert field, we, we do see all the reasons that people and all the relationships that uh, Uzbeks have in the United States. 
uh, whether it's for sports competitions, exchange, uh, visiting family, business. There's, it's the great thing about, I think, uh, our kind of window into, into that world. And for study purposes, we see a lot of denials uh, for those who, are, who intend to come to the United States for short-term academic programs. Mm -hmm. For example, like language studies or some kind of a conference, let's mm -hmm. say, they get denied most of the time. We see that if you have been accepted by uh, a school, let's mm -hmm. say, for undergraduate or graduate or PhD programs, then you will have uh, higher chances of mm -hmm. you know, getting that visa. Yeah, I would say that, you know, we look at when for student visas, we're looking at a couple things. We're looking at make sure that you're you're prepared for the course, whatever the course of study that you're, you're um, you'll be taking. We're looking that you're a serious student so that you intend on being a student. You intend on studying at this university or this short course and that you're able to pay for that uh, period of study, whether it's because you received a scholarship or maybe out of personal funds or family funds. We're looking at kind of those 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 mm -hmm. three things. Uh, I think, um, you know, I'm not, I can't give, you know, specifics about statistics, but I think it is a little easier to show if you're applying for like a four-year university, um, the the reasons and your reasons for, for serious study uh, than maybe a short course, uh, like a short English course in the United States, which, you know, frankly speaking, you can do in many places. Uh, not, online now here. Online. <laughs> so traveling far and, and, you know, these programs are rarely very uh, inexpensive, uh, maybe harder to show than if you're uh, going to study uh, like an undergraduate or graduate program in the United States. How has the pandemic changed the way you um, do these things? Because, you know, in the world of teleworking, mm -hmm. online studying, um, you can come up with a lot of reasons, basically, to tell the applicants that you don't have to be in the United States to do mm -hmm. this, right? I mean, specifically, like, for short term, for example, like, for language learning or for skill uh, building, I guess, uh, for conferences even, right? Mm -hmm. I think we don't try, by and large, to kind of make that judgment. Mm. Uh, you know, if someone wants to go do shopping in New York for their business. Say maybe they, they want to procure some things in the United States. I don't think we really question, well, why don't you just buy these things? Off and, Amazon. And, and, yeah, and send them. <laughs> uh, we take them at face value that this is something that's important. Um, like if you have a meeting, there's, a, there's, there's some value in being at that meeting or that conference in person. So I don't, I don't think we, we, we make that judgment of whether this could be done a different way. Uh, of course, these applicants should, of course, be able to like articulate and explain why this travel is important, and of course, explain if it's a tourist or business uh, their ties to come back. In terms of return, um, you obviously want people to come back once they are, you know, <laughs> visas uh, are before they expire. Actually, uh, what is Uzbekistan's record in that? How? Uh, Credible are the Uzbek citizens in terms of you know their uh, visa requirements? Well, the Department of State doesn't publish uh, publicly their kind of refusal statistics or the studies that we do that show you know overstay rates. And we do you can you can find on our Department of State web website month by month statistics by visa class on mm -hmm. issuances. Um, but I will say that we do look uh, continually across different visa categories, not just for Uzbek citizens, but for anyone here who gets a, a, a visa about how well they traveled. And we try to learn from that. Um, if, uh, if we find that, you know, maybe a, a certain visa category or a certain uh, is not being used so well, uh, then we will look at what we need to do to, to make adjustments to uh, our decision making. Uh, but I would say that, um, you know, we are offering, as, as you noticed when you were out there mm -hmm. uh, today, we are offering, offering uh, interviews for the Summer Work and Travel Program. Mm -hmm. And that is, by and large, uh, or primarily, or completely young university students. And it's quite uh, short term. It's short term, going to the U.S. for, for summer travel. Well, they'll be working and learning about American culture and getting a new kind of uh, American experience. And that is... Uh, a program that's not offered everywhere because there have been concerns in some countries of, of like a high overstay rate. And we, we are happy to 
uh, begin that program again. I think it's been, um, it was uh, not offered here for about two years. So yes. We're, yes. we're happy that uh, we're able to do that again. And you started this year. We are, of, we've yeah. already issued visas <laughs> and probably students are packing their bags. Yeah, yeah, no, they're excited <laughs> and, you know, they, they can't wait. People approach interviews, specifically at the uh, U.S. Consulate, with a great level of fear and, mm -hmm. and nervousness. Mm -hmm. um, and that definitely affects the way they perform during the interview mm -hmm. and ultimately it affects the, the decision. How do you deal with that? I will come back to this question mm -hmm. again later because um, you deal with the, um, the most sensitive parts of the Uzbek culture on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> like, of all the diplomats here, you have to be the one who is best trained, right? Because you see the Uzbek people every day. You deal with their vulnerabilities, you deal with their issues, people come in tears, people come in full yes. pride. Like, you deal with the Uzbek character, which yes. is quite complex. How do you prepare yourself for, for that challenge in general? Well, I, I look at that as a good part of the job. We get to see the, the, the variety. The of, real picture, the actually. The real picture mm -hmm. and the variety of people uh, and the reasons why they're traveling. So uh, we'll see um, a lot of the grandmothers going to see their kids in the United States or the grandkids, and we see businessmen, we see the young students, we see um, people who are more affluent as well mm -hmm. that are coming mm -hmm. for visas. So we see that, that, that variety, I think, makes concert work and the day-to-day uh, uh, process interesting. Otherwise, I guess you know persons could see it as kind of a, a slog. But I, I, I think it's 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 a great uh, benefit to be able to talk to people, even for the short period that we have, to see kind of a glimpse of of what they're doing, what reasons they're traveling to the U.S. Because I'm happy that people want to travel to the U.S. Uh, you know, I think there's so many things to see, so many things to do, so many great reasons. So I, I support that. Of course, at the same time. We want to make sure that people use their visa appropriately, that you know, this, you know tourism is not work there forever. Uh, so we, we want to be able to facilitate good travel. But um, I think, uh, yes, the work can, you know, if you have a large number of people, it can get, uh, you could know, be tired at the, at the conclusion of your interview day. But it's also very rewarding, I think, when you're, um, for example, when, when you give a visa for some work and travel person who's going to be working maybe in a, a somewhere where, where you know very well. Uh, Wendy's, McDonald's, or, or, Subway. Or, or <laughs> you know, at a city, like at a, a, a tourist city, yeah. you know, on the ocean that you know very well. You're like, uh, I'm happy. I think they're going to have a great time. Be safe. Have, have a good time. Uh, I think it, it may, it's nice when we see people traveling to go visit some of our national parks. And we have amazing sights to see. So exactly. um, uh, I think we're excited for, for those. Uh, and I sometimes will hear interview officers, you know, maybe having even a longer conversation. They're like, oh, we have to kind of get back yeah. to work. But um, <laughs> because they're, they've, there's some, some places going somewhere that's very familiar to them, mm -hmm. and they're happy that uh, to someone, advise someone gets to experience that. So, How do you usually um, train for this? Because you're trained differently than other diplomats. Right? I mean, to be the consulate chief, of course, mm -hmm. and then also consular officer, your staff, local mm -hmm. staff. What is the process? How do you, like, how often do you train? Well, there's some required training that you have to take, and there's a lot, because it's visa matters particularly, but also passport issues for U.S. passports. There's a lot of rules. Uh, there's a lot of rules and regulations, and there's different rules for different visa categories. So. Uh, there's a lot of do's and don'ts um, of an ethical as, as well as just kind of procedural. So there is just formal training that we're required to take, there's refresher training that we're required to take. And, uh, but uh, by and large, a lot of people will, you know, learn on the job, you know, shadow people who are more experienced uh, and keep a special watch on new cons officers to make sure they're kind of uh, adjudicating visas, if it's visas similarly to others, that there's not, they're not an outlier. So it's, it's, it's a continual training uh, environment, I would say. How big of a factor is the language? It's big. I think you, you want to be able to understand the kind of cultural nuances. Uh, so they do, uh, we have a mixture of Russian and uh, Uzbek. Uzbek speakers. Uh, so it is important if someone uh, though speaks a language that uh, the consular officer is not, not trained on, then we will we'll find someone to help uh, be an interpreter. But certainly, uh, 
if you're if you know the language naturally and and fluently, then then that's that's more of an advantage mm -hmm. and more advantage for the visa applicant, I would say. There have been um, several restrictions overall in terms of U.S. immigration and visiting the United States uh, in the last, let's say, five years, uh, you know, starting from the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. And so we saw that the green card got closed for a while, and it, for, for six months first, and then it was expanded. And so that definitely affected your work here as well. Uh, are you back full scale on the DV lottery? Yes, we are certainly back. And I would say that uh, month by month of what we're processing for the diversity visa or the green card lottery, we are processing numbers that are double than what, wow. one, than what we did pre-pandemic. Um, so the, the numbers are quite significant. Uh, and I would say that's for a number of reasons. I think we, you know, we value the program. We know that it is of great interest here and there's a, there's a really high participation rate in, in the green card line. It's a very uniquely American yes. program <laughs> and we want to support that. But also recognizing that I think for a period of years there were very low number of processing and applications. So um, I don't want to say we're trying to make up for that, but, but, but we are uh, looking at it this fiscal year uh, and, and, and approaching it very aggressively and trying to get as many people as we possibly can uh, a chance for the interview. So those whose wins were expired, uh, what happened? You, you, you're not considering them, right? Like, I guess that 2020, 2021, or? 2020 and 2021, the fiscal year 20, DV 2020 and 2021. Uh, as you might be aware, there, there is ongoing litigation. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. There are several court cases uh, on, on uh, those, those, those years. Uh, and I, I can just say that I know that the department is is looking at at that and is still has a plan, and we're just waiting for guidance and information on the department's plan to comply uh, with those court orders. So we're kind of in a in a, in a wait and see mode. Uh, I, you know, I think embassies and consulates worldwide wait and see what that that plan for compliance is. Um, but meanwhile, uh, we are moving full full ahead with this year's uh, applicants. 2022. 2022. I guess the message for those who are waiting <laughs> impatiently is wait. The ones from previous years. Yeah, yeah, from previous, previous years? years. Yes, the yes, frustrated. I, I, I think so. Uh, I think yeah, they winners. Will, they will just have to wait to see uh, how those uh, the litigation, how those cases proceed, and what the the guidance that the Department of State puts out on on the plan to implement those court orders. Mm -hmm. Very often we get questions about the, the, the communication with the, with the consulate. Mm -hmm. So they usually like forward us the uh, emails and they don't know what to do with it because they find it a bit vague in terms of what to do next. So we usually say, hey, you know, just keep on contacting them, mm -hmm. you know, until you, you get an answer or wait until you hear from them again. Mm -hmm. Like if they haven't updated anything, then yeah. you shouldn't really do anything. Is that, is that a good advice? I, th I think so. I would say... For the pandemic, uh, one, of the, one of the problems was when the consular section was closed for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. A lot of those emails that were coming through about cases, uh, you know, there were there was extended delays, and you know probably some that that weren't answered, uh, because quite simply put, there weren't uh, at that at periods of time. Um, some of the consular employees were not here at the section because of the COVID restrictions. Uh, so that was one of the challenges when we started re resuming operations, particularly on the immigrant visa side, is to look at all those cases. There's you know hundreds of cases that were pending um, that had they're not new cases. They're cases that had been started, but maybe they were lacking some document. Maybe there's some question that kind of put those cases in kind of a pending status. So we uh, started looking at those and communicating with the petitioner or with a visa applicant on what's the next steps. And we've moved, you know, uh, in excess of 400 cases uh, that in that kind of status to a resolution. And uh, I think we've, that's part of the, the backlog challenge that we had. It was not just new cases, but it was cases that were in a pending status. So. Um, Do you still communicate mainly via email? Should people know that? Yes, so, because uh, we often communicate with the petitioner in the United States and the time zones are different. So um, we, but if when someone comes in for an interview or an immigrant visa, for example, and say they're, they're missing something that their case is not able to be issued right now, we do provide them in writing what the thing what they, they need. What they need to do. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, in many in many cases, an, an email is really not not necessary. You know, we say here you're missing this document, please, because the immigrant visa is very document heavy, unlike unlike the mm -hmm, non-immigrant mm -hmm. visas. So we're like we're missing this, and then uh, in most cases, the petitioner can simply upload that document into uh, our consular system, and maybe send us an email or saying, hey, it's uploaded, we see it, and then we can move on uh, to possibly issuance or, or whatever the next. And just to make sure, you don't you don't communicate via Telegram, right? Because as you know, Uzbekistan lives on Telegram. So um, you don't. Telegram is not used uh, no. for this purpose. Okay, no, it would, we, so we get these, a lot of emails, uh, I think, um, <laughs> people will not provide their case number or just provide their name. It's like, oh, this is, you know, so-and-so, as if we know them. We have, we get hundreds of emails yeah, every day. Imagine. So we do really ask people that when, when they reach out to us about their case, they, you know, they say, here's my case number, here is the visa applicant's name. So we can look it up and see, you know, what the status is. You know, if someone's saying, yeah. hey, I just updated my medical exam, okay, we can... We can check that. Like pay attention to the details. Not just like, right? hey, from yeah. John. You know, we, we don't. Yeah, I was there on Friday, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just yeah, right. help us out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, security um, checks on um, DV lottery winners. Um, they take longer than than a few months, right? No, I would say um, the security checks for immigrant visas are the same for for uh, diversity visa or green card lottery winners as as anyone else. So. Mm. Um, no, that the we have uh, already issued uh, a number of green card winners this season, and um, I think you, often if uh, if everything's smooth with someone's case, uh, they come in for an interview. If everything goes well, uh, in most cases for the DV lotteries, the ones we've seen so far have been quite prepared. Uh, they can get their visa the next week. Mm -hmm. that, that's mm -hmm. that quick. Mm -hmm. What does security check consist of in general? What should people like expect to be happening during that period? Well, the security we have a number of kind of law enforcement security tools that you know the the visa application is you know like in most countries is reviewed uh, against. So if there are any questions about uh, anything, Backgrounds. yeah, we we will. We will let you know, um, but otherwise, an applicant just needs to, you know, complete their application honestly and accurately. Uh, there's nothing else that's required. And when they get, uh, let's say, when they get denied, you do provide explanations. Yes. But most of the time, that's not enough for people, so they want to know more. And I'm sure you deal with that a lot. Yes. Uh, what happens if they have additional questions? When is, when is your answer is the final? Like no more explanation. <laughs> this is it. Well, like you said, we, we provide a denial in writing, and so for non reasons, it will be a letter that says, under the section of U.S. law, what this denial is based on. Uh, and someone can go to our website, and we do have some things on visa refusals, and also the Department of State has uh, you know, information on this that explains in more like frequently asked questions about what this exactly means, and you know, does it mean can I reapply, can I do these things? We have information about that. For immigrant visas, if there's a denial, usually it's something a little bit more, more serious or a little more complex because of the, the higher standards that immigrant mm -hmm. visas have. But we will also still provide in writing uh, what, uh, what the denial might be. Um, Do the winners know from the start that uh, winning the card, well, winning the lottery doesn't guarantee them the, uh, the immigration visa? It is on our website. It is uh -huh. on the Department of State's website. It's a good good point, and I thank you for, for raising because I think there is a misperception that winning the, the, the green lottery. card lottery is not a guarantee that you get an interview, and it's not a guarantee that you get a visa. Um, it does put you in a pool that if you fill in your application and you get things, your process moved fairly quickly, mm -hmm. uh, that goes through a system that uh, will get you scheduled uh, for an interview, um, but it's based on a number of, of factors. So this is what we're trying to do right now. We are trying to every month we're we have scheduled uh, diversity visa applicants because we're trying to get as many uh, applicants as we can um, before the fiscal year deadline. And at the same time, of course, you know we can't do DV applications every day because we have other services. You know, as the people going for tourism, the people reuniting with their spouse or child or parent. So we're trying to balance that. But uh, I will, again, I will say that we are doing 
double the numbers for, for green card uh, winners this year than we did pre-pandemic. Is a person informed about the fact that he might be banned or she might be banned or let's say blacklisted for some reason? So if you, if you had some kind of permanent visa and eligibility, uh, you would be provided that in writing. So say you went to a visa interview and for whatever reason, maybe, uh, maybe you overstayed your visa mm, for very, very violated long. Violated yes. yeah, somewhere. Then you'd be provided, that's not a permanent visa and eligibility, but it, it can be for an extended period. And, but the officer then would inform you in writing about the section of law and uh, the consequences. And often we, we also provide whether an ineligibility is waiverable, whether you can apply for a waiver. It shouldn't be a surprise, um, but unfortunately I think some people don't handle their own application. They so kinda... when you find out that somebody is lying and you deny, right? So the application is inaccurate, whether it's uh, mm -hmm. for non-immigrant or immigrant visa, you give them that written explanation mm -hmm. about why they're being denied. Does that denial letter say about the fact that that person cannot apply or cannot play the lottery again or, you know, something to consider for the near future? Most denials are just, a, this is not a permanent denial. It's just, mm. you know, for a non-immigrant visa, you're not qualified for the visa at this time. And I've been in places and some, where someone will come book it, you know, the next day mm -hmm. or the next week mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, you, you know. And we will, in those cases, uh, will have another consular officer, a different person uh, interview that applicant. Uh, so those, something like that, it's not a permanent uh, refusal. But there are some ineligibilities where someone has done something or there's some kind of um, violation of the law that can be more, more permanent. And they are provided in writing um, what that means. You have a special role in terms of representing the United States. People see American when they talk mm -hmm. to you, yeah. when they come asking uh, for a visa. And what, what does it feel like to be that uh, officer, right? You're the gateway. Uh, they will remember you forever if they get denied. You know, this is, you determine a lot in terms of um, cultural uh, connections and relations between countries. It's not the same thing like if you're a political officer, right? Because you just deal with a specific group of people, whereas you're dealing again, as I said, with the entire um, mm -hmm. society. How do you deal with that challenge? W what kind of a role, I guess, that sense of feeling play in your work? Yes, I, I would certainly agree that sometimes the first time uh, someone has spoken with an American might be at the visa window, uh, might be the first time, uh, uh, the first impression. So, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, our engagements, our interactions are professional, courteous, friendly. Uh, of course, you know, it's, it's a challenge to refuse someone in a very friendly way, but we do try to be professional about it. It's, we're not passing any judgment, uh, it is, you know, we're following the, the, the U.S. law, but we want, we want to come away, we want people to, uh, to, to leave the concert section, whether they've been issued or refused, that they believe at least they've had a fair and professional process. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not under any illusions that, you know, applying for a visa is a fun or, a, you know, great way to spend your spend your morning uh i know it's, it's a bureaucratic process okay. you go through many steps people approach but... this very emotionally i'm sure you see this every day mm -hmm. right i mean it's excitement it's nervousness mm -hmm. it's everything it's a mixture of so many different feelings and sometimes they even even though they suspect that they may get denied they go for it anyways you know it's kind of an investment like they, they take that risk and and then whenever i've talked to any um you know applicants especially those who have been denied they remember every detail they remember mm. who they talked to they describe the physical appearance yeah. of that person and the interview mm. process uh, what i'm trying to say is that this is a this is a lifelong experience sometimes for them mm. and um do you get angry people because uh, we have seen some really angry um, denied uh, mm -hmm. you know Uzbeks who can now especially they can go on social media mm -hmm. they can talk about that they can complain and I've uh, seen uh, Uzbeks who've been denied visas go to the MFA of mm -hmm. Uzbekistan and you know demand justice yeah. how do you deal with those situations well we try to deal with them professionally we understand that there is a lot of emotion and I'm not going to say that we get every decision 100% correctly, 
Uh, we look at every case individually and we look at the totality of circumstances and we try to make our best judgment based on U.S. law. Uh, and so we do get, uh, on occasion, people are very upset and we just usually in most cases just allow that person to, to cool down and, and uh, you know, we don't, don't really, we don't get into kind of a, um, a war of words on this is why I'm refusing, and I, I, I get that. What is not tolerated during the interview? When do you say, like, no, please leave? Have you, have you had those well, kind of situations? It's rare, but usually, um, you know, after we've made our decision and after you've given the, if it's a refusal and we give, you know, no one's ever really clamoring when they got a visa issue. So it's always when it's about a visa refusal. When we've given the decision, given someone's passport back, uh, then the interview is concluded, and and obviously if, if someone lingers and stays longer, uh, you know, asking we, we're for answers. asking for answers. We're, we're politely, you know, go, you know, seek this information. Uh, but of course, at some point, that person is being a hindrance to other customers who are also, you know, their time is valuable. They're waiting for an interview uh, as well. So, uh, in in. It's very rarely we need to do more than that. You just you just stop, you know, engaging. We're not going to answer those questions. We've made the decision, and it resolves itself. The person realizes they're not getting anything further. As far as we know, everybody is equal in front of you. Like any Uzbek mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. an equal citizen. You don't discriminate based on their political uh, status or economic status, mm -hmm. right? I mean, of course, official applicants are considered differently because these are delegations going mm -hmm. to the United States. But uh, we know that in the past, uh, maybe even now, you can tell us, uh, people do use their connections. They want to get to you through mm -hmm. political connections, through, let's say, economic connections, mm -hmm. through their networks. How do you deal with those uh, circumstances? Yes. So, like you said, for persons traveling on official like diplomatic visas for, for the government of Uzbekistan, it goes through a different channel, uh, and there's no requirement for an interview, and we process those. Or for exchange programs. Uh, for ex exchange programs, the person still needs to come in for, for an interview, but we arrange those, those differently. Separately. Uh, and for visitors as well, like official uh, visitors? Um, not, not so much for official visitors, but we do provide different courtesies for a wide range of, of persons. For example, if we know that there is a sports team mm -hmm. coming, like mm -hmm. we recently we had uh, the women's uh, national soccer team, right? So or football team, mm -hmm. right? So there's a, a lot of players and supporting staff. Uh, you know, it, it makes sense that we would arrange a special time because there's so many. Uh, if they tried to each book an online appointment, they'd be spread around uh, many n number of days and just would not be convenient. So it's convenient for us and convenient for them. So we do provide those accommodations. But um, to, to your, I think really to the core of your question about people of influence trying to get special treatment. Mm -hmm. And we all have to follow the U.S. rules and regulations on coming to the, to the visa law. And, and I think that's why we earlier you were saying that some people that were upset uh, that they didn't get the visa um, because, uh, you know, it's, it's not that we, we look at them each individually and we don't see a certain religious class or a political class of, you know, often we don't even know this information. It's not on our visa applications and it's not something that we inquire about. So we, we try to approach this as fairly as possible. Mm -hmm. What if uh, artists or performers, you know, mm -hmm. are, are traveling together? Because, you know, um, Uzbeks are a growing community mm -hmm. in the United States mm -hmm. and they very often invite uh, performers from here, mm -hmm. musicians, mm -hmm. uh, groups, bands. Mm -hmm. How are those considered? So if there's just a handful, then then they could just make an online appointment. Again, I th I recognize that it's difficult to make it at this time because there's so much demand. Mm -hmm. uh, but under more normal circumstances, they could just make an appointment and come. But if there's like a very large band or a very large performing group, you know, 20, 30 dancers or performers or, or whatever, uh, we're more than happy to make a special time or towards the end of the visa uh, morning to to accommodate them so they're. It's easier for us, I think, and more efficient if we have people as a group rather than, 
you know, we got the, the drummer here, and then we have a bunch of other people, right. and then we have the one musician. It's better to, to be to, more to, compact. Just to yeah. see everyone and be able to move them through efficiently. And their chances also depend on the on the reasons, right? Specific mm -hmm. reasons, for example. Very often we have Uzbek community holding some kind of a cultural event and they invite them. And they, they're not going through any official channels, it's just mm -hmm. the Uzbek community they are inviting them, usually mm -hmm. private. Yeah. Uh, for you know, the request comes from very private sources, mm -hmm. and uh, when do performers uh, get denied? Like, what are some of the reasons that you deny? Uh, some of the reasons that a, a performer would be denied, I, I, you know, there's a multitude of different reasons. But uh, if we don't think they're going to be doing what they're saying, they're mm -hmm. be, that's probably mm -hmm. the, the primarily mm -hmm. reason. The, the the primary reason, uh, if. Um, you know, if someone's a performer and has a long history of doing international uh, events and tours, tours, uh, maybe even been to the United States before, then that's a story that makes pretty, you know, pretty quick sense. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But suddenly, if there's you know a whole group of experienced performers, <laughs> and there's someone that we're not quite sure what their value to the group is, uh, we may look at them a little differently. Yeah. So a member of a band can be denied because individually, right, based yes. on his or her background. Well, you know, Uzbekistan, as you know, has a deep and wide record of corruption. This is, this is a, you're, you're working in a country where bribery is a way of life still. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I've, over the years, I've heard all kinds of stories, some of them are completely inaccurate, of mm -hmm. course, that you can bribe your way into getting an American visa and mm -hmm. that these kind of things happened and there are networks who help you do that. Mm -hmm. What is the situation like in your? Yeah. I know you've been here since uh, August. August of last mm -hmm. year. Have you dealt with any kind of corruption cases that involve basically your work? Well, we have. We haven't. There's been no ex instances of any at uh, any bribery from for a consular officer to make a decision. Uh, we know there's lots of visa facilitators, and there's mm -hmm. some right outside our embassy, as you as you can see. And they agents. Agents, and they provide different range of services. Some are pretty, you know, innocuous, pretty harmless, where they're just helping someone fill out a visa application. Uh, to unfortunately, they're, they're, we're aware that uh, some of these visa facilitators will book the appointments, and then they will sell them. I mean, the appointments are free. You know, our appoint online appointments are free. Just like but, playing the DV lottery. Yeah, and they will book the appointment, and then they will sell them. Uh, and charge you know significant amounts of money to someone um, to use them, and and that is that's not just a problem here in, in Uzbekistan, but it's, it's a problem in other parts of the world as well. And so we're looking at ways that we can um, you know uh, mitigate that. I mean, the the clear way, the clear, clear solution is that we get to more normal operations where we just have more appointments available and so no one needs to go to a visa facilitator to have to feel compelled to, to buy an appointment when they can just do it themselves because I think you know most people wouldn't do that. With but, growing number of travel agencies they're also visa facilitators sometimes right? It can be. Do you, do you have a list of like credible agencies that you you work with that people for example I mean you don't have to, to provide mm -hmm. the list right now but is it safe is it mm -hmm. trustworthy enough to work with them? We don't, and I think I think we'd be hesitant to do that because then management can change, people can right. change, and we don't want to be directing people to one to group others. and Just then, come it, to you then, directly. It, then it changes. Because uh, so much of our of what we do, uh, you know, the application is, is a long process for the non immigrant visa, but it, it easily can be done by someone uh, on their own. They don't need uh, a, a visa facilitator. And I would just, if I can, if, if I may, sure. on on the green card lottery, on the diversity visa particularly, uh, I would say, you know, my advice would be really to avoid visa facilitators, uh, because that entry application is free and it's not very hard. It's just your basic biographical information, some questions. It's something that anyone can do on their own. Maybe you, if you have a family member or a friend help you, because it's, you know, if, if, it's, in if you don't, it's in English, you know, I understand that. But there are some requirements on that visa, on the diversity visa application that you really need to pay attention to and uh, record on the application accurately, or it could result in disqualification. And we have seen this, and there are so many disclaimers on our website saying, please, you know, if it asks you to list all of your biological children under 21, 
regardless if they're living in your household or another, list all of them. If you don't do that and you win, so you will be disqualified. So I can't emphasize, emphasize that enough because you know, it's, a, it's a little heartbreaking. Someone will fill out their, you know, their entry, usually in October, November. If they find out they, they win, which would be usually the following May, and then sometime after that, they'll get an interview. And if we find out, for example, at the interview, after then they've paid the visa fees, that you know, they recorded their, their date of birth incorrectly, then they'll be disqualified. Uh, and any money they paid at the time of the interview, because that's the first time you pay any fees, then you lose. It's not refundable. So uh, you know, it's 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 um, it, it's terrible when when on a technicality. But we have to uh, enforce those because those are worldwide standards. Uh, so I would just say on that kind of visa facilitator, for particularly for diversity visas, is uh, don't use them. Uh, it's a free it's a free entry. Um, you have there's no one's going to have more interest in your application than yourself. Definitely. Uh, yeah. And unfortunately, some of those visa facilitators will also take your application for one year and then just recycle it. But maybe during that time period where you submitted it some years ago, now you have a new child. And but they submit the old application and now your visa is no longer accurate because you didn't have your own interest. So it will be disqualified. And uh, but if only you just did it yourself again, it's free, um, then, then you'd be okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, I think that's probably my number one advice for, for you know, green card lottery um, aspiring uh, you know, winners <laughs> is, is really when you fill out that application, that entry application, take it serious, look at the instructions, make sure it's accurate. Because if it's not, it could result in disqualification. So. And, and it'll be too late. It will be too It'll late. It will be too late. In your work, you have to obviously uh, cooperate with the law enforcement agencies here, right? You may not deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis, but in general, I mean, we have had several deportations uh, from mm -hmm. the United States. Mm -hmm. There are people who have been deported here. Mm -hmm. Do you deal with those cases? Like, what yeah. what is the I guess the um, the parameters of your cooperation with yeah. the law enforcement, with the justice system here? Yeah, I think persons who are removed from from the United States, uh, it's generally not not our our area. That's usually uh, a different area in, in the embassy. Mm -hmm. I mean, often we are aware um, because there is kind of a migration kind of aspect mm -hmm. to it, but generally it's it's not. Um, is you know we're looking at p people using legitimate travel to the United States and not so much you know, once if they've violated uh, some rules in the United States. While we're aware of it, it's, it's not kind of our, our, our main focus. And you do provide services to American citizens yes. here. So that's another, you know, yes. a very important work you do. How safe is Uzbekistan for Americans right now? I think it's very safe. I think Uzbekistan's a, I, I, I have my family here uh, and um, my children are old enough to, to or one of them is old enough to take a taxi on his yeah. own and go out and about with his friends. and. Uh, I have like not zero concerns, <laughs> of course, because I'm a parent. I'm always going to be concerned, but as far as you know, crime and things of that, that nature, I think uh, very, very safe. Yeah, because you know the State Department travel alerts don't really get into the details; they're more mm -hmm. general, but they don't necessarily describe Uzbekistan to be very safe. <laughs> yeah, Central Asia isn't usually described yeah. to be, you know, the safest um, area in the world. If, if you look at those official uh, alerts, this is why I'm asking. Yeah. You know, well, I think when you look at safety, there's a number of factors, right? right? So mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's crime and there's, you know, also I think most people that, uh, you know, find themselves injured or something. Americans overseas, it's usually a traffic accident. Uh, so mm -hmm. um, traffic here is, a, is you know, another story. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been an experience. Uh, I don't know if I'm getting to be a better driver or a worse oh. driver. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's fight for life in yes, general, yeah. right? You're on yes. the wheel. And... So, yeah, I'm sure when I return to the U.S., I will be getting a, a speeding ticket or a traffic ticket mm -hmm. very soon mm -hmm. right after mm -hmm. if I pick up all the habits. But, yeah, no, we, we provide some information. It's our country-specific information on our travel.state.gov website. It uh, goes into a number of different categories uh, about, this is a, a portal, a website for Americans, right? So this is saying, you know, here are some of the entry and visa requ requirements that you need to be focused on. 
Uh, here's some information on crime and safety. So we do have those, like you said, um, it's, it's not always super specific, but we do update it and we're, we'll be close to, uh, we'll be getting a new update for it shortly. You know, many people think that Ambassador Rosenblum decides on visas. You know that, right? I do. <laughs> you, yeah. I do. So, you know, very often we get letters or phone calls, mm -hmm. even or texts saying yeah. that, can you please tell Ambassador Rosenblum yes. to give me visa yes. or, you know, yes. I've been denied. People don't know the difference between, you know, who is an ambassador and yeah. who is a counselor in chief. How would you explain what are the differences and why you are the guy in charge of this? Yeah. And I mean, I would even go further. Like, I, I, I'm a consular section chief. But I can't tell the interviewing officer to, uh, no, you need to, before anything starts, you need to issue that person, you need to refuse that uh -huh. person. You know, that, that's, that would be outside the bounds of, of my responsibility. Now, obviously, if there was something that was done wrong, like by, you know, not, not someone's judgment, but something that was, you know, refused for the wrong, wrong legal reason, then we, then I would, you know, look at that and we would, uh, maybe correct that, but um, but but you're you're absolutely right. The consular section uh, has very unique privileges and, and very unique responsibilities for for visa matters. We have to have a special consular commission to do consular services in a country. So no one else, uh, an, another section or the ambassador or anyone else, can um, you know it would be a violation. And and this is. Probably something the ambassador Rosenblum might have speak for him, but I imagine he's. We've heard he, him say that. I'm sure he's yeah. probably glad that you know <laughs> he doesn't have to go to the consular section. Yeah, and we've interview heard people. him and other ambassadors say, "Hey, I have, not, I have nothing to do with the process." Yeah. Because, because as you alluded to before, there's a lot of training and a lot of particular rules and regulations, and so we receive that and we have the the responsibility to adjudicate visas and passports and and and, and consular services. So that's that's our purview. Uh, but again, you know, I I can't even. So some people think the same, that, oh, you're in the consular section and this was refused, just overturn it. Um, if a visa was uh, adjudicated properly, you know, we looked at the circumstances, there was, uh, this is the judgment of the consular officer based on the information that was available. Uh, you know, the best I can say would be, you know, reapply. Um, maybe, you know, provide more information on this side if that was a concern. Can people complain? They can they file a complaint? They can complain, uh, and we do get you know every once in a while complaints in our on our inbox, um, and uh, you know I, I welcome feedback of many different kinds. Mm -hmm. and we we've heard about people uh, that had to buy uh, visa appointments from 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 people who've come forward and say, "Hey, I just went to this visa facilitator. I, you're I fully booked. Yeah. I had to pay you know a hundred dollars to just to get an appointment. You know this is this is outrageous." Uh, and that's helpful to know that this is happening. So then we can look, okay, how do we kind of alleviate that? Um, but if, you know, not all complaints are equal, you know, we've uh, got complaints that, you know, please have the ambassador uh, issue or interview this yeah. person. And, you know, that's, <laughs> you get that, that. that's not realistic. That's, but they that's, usually, people want to complain after they get the denial letters. We that's don't, usually. it's not in proportion to, to um, I get the number of refusals, I think, um, you know, we do, and maybe, and it could be for a variety of reasons. There's information on our website about what that means, um, and maybe it was explained at the interview. Um, but we certainly are able to send in, you know, send a, a, a complaint into our inbox. Uh, I don't think, um, I wouldn't expect a response. It'll be read. But if you're simply saying that... If you don't hear back, then that's the case. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're saying, you know, I, uh, I want to see my grandkids and, and I was refused and I'm upset about that, I mean, there's not really anything that we can say to that besides, you know, people are, you're allowed to reapply. Uh, there's no time limit in that. I mean, I wouldn't recommend um, reapplying right after a visa refusal unless, unless you have something that's materially different than what you presented. Um, it's also important to note that there, there is no, we have no quota of visa refusals or visa issuance that sometimes comes up. I was just going to ask that. I mean, are yeah. there limits, though? No, no there's not. No. There's, there's, there's not a number we have to, to hit. That's why we, you know, when I say we look at each case uh, on its own, 
it, it, it's, it's accurate. So And same thing with the DV lottery, like in terms of winners, because we keep on hearing about quarters, right? Well, for the DV winners, there, you know, the department uh, sets aside fifty-five thousand mm -hmm. immigrant year. visas annually from all over the world. For all over the world. And so a portion of that will be for the qualified countries. So there'll be a, you know, a, a set number of, of winners from, for Uzbekistan. And as a policy, as a worldwide policy, and this is also on, on, on the website, no country can have more than 7% of the total winners, right? So, uh, so, so there's that kind of limit. But at 7% of 55,000, uh, it's you know more than more than 3,500, so um, that would be uh, significant. It's just another visa tip. You know, people that are coming in for the non visa particularly shouldn't be kind of like a passive interviewee. You know, you, you shouldn't. If a culture asks, asks you, you know, what do you do for business or what do you do for work, you shouldn't say entrepreneur or business. You need to be explain specific. that. You need to just provide the story exactly. You know, what your role is. Uh, because business can mean many different things. You could be the person selling samsas, or you could be running a Chevrolet plant. Mm -hmm. There's a wide range in there, and, and we're interested in knowing what, what exactly does that mean. So, Does the fact that somebody is unemployed change the decision? It depends, again, on you know, my, my, my thing. It depends on the visa category, right? So for if you're traveling as a, as a tourist, or I guess for like a tourist, and you're unemployed, and say you're middle-aged, uh, then I think it, it, you know, it, it would spur, you know, how are you affording this? That would raise some questions. I mean, maybe you're unemployed and you're independently wealthy, you know, and you travel all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that would be a different scenario, but mm -hmm. most people aren't like mm -hmm. that. So, but, you know, young people are, are often unemployed, they're students. Um, Self-employed, increasingly self -employed, in this yeah. country? Yeah, that, that's true. Because, you know, some fear that because I don't officially work somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, I have this, uh, I'm just establishing my business mm -hmm. or I'm starting a project and I don't have to necessarily, I mean, I can't provide that official paperwork, mm -hmm. you know, a certificate or verification yeah. of something. So even there, it's all individual based. Like you yes, look at and that's a good point about documents. Um, maybe something worth just briefly mentioning that, you know, we don't need lots of documents. Uh, you know, there are some, some visa categories that require, like if you're a student, you need to have this form called the I-20 that shows what school you got into and some details about it. But you know, visa applicants do not need to gather letters of reference or bring their bank statements mm -hmm. or you know, find their land deeds or property information. We, we, they don't? We, they don't. We you don't, don't need them to see, to, 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 to be assured that they are returning? No. We won't ask for them. I mean, almost in all circumstances, we are not going to be asking for like bank statements or mm. property documents or anything of that nature. So it's not worth gathering. Um, Unless they're asked for them. But it's, I, I'll, because, I'll be honest, it's here. Uh, we're not going to be asking for, for uh, that document in most cases if you're just like, going to be a tourist. Now, I will say, mm. like, if you're going for expensive medical treatment in the United States, um, then you, you know, we would want to see something from like a hospital or a clinic that says, you know, this person is going to be, needs to undergo this tre treatment, it'll take this long, and it's going to cost approximately that much. And then, we'll, then we will be asking, like, you know, um, how how can uh, you afford this so bring what's asked bring what's asked and be honest be honest yes yeah. Good. can't go wrong there yeah <laughs> honesty <laughs> honesty honesty well thank you so much you know, for this pleasure. conversation yeah. for this extensive conversation yes, yes it's, pleasure. it's been, it's been it. a pleasure yes and i'm sure we'll be getting more questions and okay. it's great that you actually do time to time you do facebook sessions too mm -hmm. right like yeah we, at we, various. we will be doing one on diversity visas good i think we have a good right. story to tell yeah. uh this year wonderful wonderful thank you thank you mm -hmm.